Yeah, so I keep getting introduced as our next speaker started programming at age eight. And then after my talks, a lot of people come to me and they're like, hey, this that's really impressive. How'd you do that? Um, the short answer is I grew up very sick and there was not much I could do. And there's a lot of trauma and, and stuff. And, and I was kind of forced into it. But it's YouTube. Let's let's have the longer answer. Let's talk about that. So to understand how I started coding at such a young age, we need to go back in time to like before I was born, to go to even before I was like conceived of, um, maybe even when my mother was a child. Um, so my mother, uh, my parents, by the way, these people here, uh, my mother of which is this one, um, you know, had a, had a father with a genetic condition called hemophilia. Uh, hemophilia is basically you just never stop bleeding once you start. And, you know, from that alone, it's very easy for you to think, oh, well, then just don't get cut. But the truth is bleeding as a human being is way more complex than just getting cut because I don't know if you know this, you probably don't because of your healthy body privilege, which my grandfather didn't have and which I don't have. We'll talk about that. Um, human beings bleed all the time, like all the time. We're constantly bleeding inside internally somewhere. For example, if you climb up stairs, then you'll actually start bleeding somewhere in your leg and that that blood flow will go and settle in the nearest if you bleed long enough will go and settle in the nearest joint cavity which is probably your knee um, so if you don't stop bleeding ever and you just climb up some stairs then a few hours later your knee is going to be full of blood and it's going to be swollen up and it's going to be painful and you know um without getting too in the anatomy a joint is a ball and socket there's a joint cavity where the ball and socket kind of combine if that fills with blood, they, they kind of come apart and it kind of feels dislocated. It's very painful. Um, and this happens from climbing stairs, from throwing a ball, heck, even from waving, um, from shaking hands, from opening heavy doors, from putting on a backpack. Literally everything causes human beings to bleed. And for those with hemophilia, it just never stops. So this was my grandfather. Um, grew up in India. It's a miracle that he even lived to be old enough to have children uh, because how do you how do you like start bleeding on the inside from some trivial task and then never stop and then live um anyway i uh, had hemophilia had my mother and then eventually my mother got married wedding photos and and got pregnant um with my brother first and then with me um before i was born right um a nurse uh, they, they kind of suspected that I had hemophilia because it's genetic. Um, my brother didn't, but there's still a 50-50 chance because one of my parents has the gene. Um, so a nurse went to my mother and, um, and said, hey, there's a chance your child is going to be born with this and their quality of life is going to struggle. The medical bills are too expensive. So a viable option for you is to abort the pregnancy. Um, I should have been, well, there, there was consideration anyway of me being an abortion. To which, thankfully, my mother uh, swiftly declined and was like, no, I'm having, I'm having this child. And so um, she, she insisted, and then, and then I was born. And, you know, obviously when, when you have a new baby, it's like, yeah, we have a new baby. It's, it's fantastic. And it stayed that way for about three months. And at this point you have, you know, I'm three months old. My mother is kind of carrying me, uh, but I, I just, I never stopped crying. And it's weird. She's like, dude, I've, I've fed you. I burp you. You slept. What's up? I'm just like really unappeasable. Right. And then she keeps carrying me and hoping for the best, holds me in front of a mirror um, and notices that my elbow is the size of my head. And she's like, oh, I see what's happening with the joint bleeding, uh-oh. Took me to the hospital, confirmed our worst fear came true. Tejas has severe hemophilia, uh, specifically severe hemophilia A. This kind, you just die, it's the worst. Um, you die from something you don't even expect, walking, uh, backpacks, whatever, um, from blood loss, from these things, right? Um, and so it was a bit of a shock to the family uh, for many reasons, one of which also being treatment. There, there is treatment, um, but even to this day, to this day, the treatment 
is among the most expensive treatment in the world. My life, thanks to capitalism, has a price tag. Um, the treatment for the dose I take today costs somewhere in the neighborhood of 27,000 US dollars per week. 27,000 US dollars per week. That's what it costs to keep me alive. And we'll get to this eventually, but that's why I live in Germany. And that's why I cannot live in the United States. Anyway, so I'm I'm three months old. We figured out, uh-oh, his medical bills. Uh-oh, he's going to die probably. Um, what do we do? What do we do? Um, so the answer is obvious. Keep him, protect him, take care of him, look after him, make sure nothing happens to him. It's a bit hard when like waving causes you to bleed internally. Um, also, if we could get out of India, that'd be great because then we could maybe pay for the medicine somehow. Maybe it's better somewhere else. So in the middle of all of this, um, my dad um, gets a job. Uh, my, my, my dad isn't a university graduate, um, but somehow, uh, for miraculous reasons, got a job uh, in the tiny nation, the FIFA World Cup host of 2022, Qatar, in 1997. Um, I was four years old when this happened. And we didn't even know what Qatar was. What is it? Point it out on a map. I don't know. It's a small, is it Saudi Arabia? Is it Dubai? It's a tiny country, right? Um, we moved there with nothing. Like, I remember there's a mattress on the floor. Um, nothing. Relatively low income, I think, at the time. I can't remember. I was four years old. But it seemed like we weren't living in, in much. Um, and at the time, um, you know, just trying to keep me safe. A little four-year-old Tejas. Uh, don't die. Um, and one fine day, I find out I have stomach pain. And you, like, you, we get stomach pain, you know? Especially when you eat like a staple Indian diet with spicy curries and whatever. So I was like, whatever, it's just a stomach ache. It'll, it'll pass. Didn't pass. Um, didn't pass for a few days, actually. And then towards the end, um, the stomach pain got worse to the point where I'm like, I'm, I'm passing out. I'm losing consciousness. Um, and at this point, my mom's like, what is happening? So at some point, I become fully unconscious um, for at least a bit longer. Um, and then, you know, my dad's at work. My mom's panicking. What do we what do we do? We, we, we just got here. We, we don't know. And so does the best she can, goes, um, finds a taxi because we don't have a car or anything, puts me in the taxi, says, get him to the hospital, the children's hospital, the children's emergency, whatever, ASAP. We go to the children's emergency. I, I'm not conscious for any of this. This is what my family tells me. Um, lay me down on a bed, do some tests, and they're like, oh my gosh, this kid is out of blood. Apparently, the stomach pain was me bleeding into my stomach for days faster than my heart could replenish it. And I was basically dead. Um, the children's emergency wasn't sufficient, so they put me in an ambulance from there took me to the, the main, like the big hospital and in the ambulance, you know, it's just chaos. Like people going, oh my God, what's going to happen? What's going to happen? What's going to happen? What's going to happen? The doctor goes to my mom and is like, ma'am, I don't know if you're spiritual, if you pray, but now is the best time because we don't know what's going to happen to your, to your little boy. And we get there. Um, they pump me full of whole blood. Um, and some clotting agents, and I, I, I must have been unconscious for days, uh, but eventually I remember waking up and some weird smell in my nose. Turns out they had me on oxygen. That stuff smells weird. Um, and I turn to the side as a four-year-old and I see my mom going, oh my gosh, you're back. Yes, you're back. And, and it's this beautiful celebration and everything's uh, amazing. Um, and, and, you know, that lasts only so long until we start thinking, oh, what is this going to cost? Because this is expensive medicine and we don't have, what is this going to cost? That is when we found out that in Qatar, for expats, like not even citizens or anything, emergency health care. It's free. It's free, free of cost, free of cost. What? That's amazing. And so, okay, emergency healthcare is free. Okay, I'm gonna be fine. And 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 I was, but but here's here's the caveat. It's it's emergency healthcare that's free. Um, I would continue growing up 
uh, in, in Qatar, going to school, doing whatever kids do, um, benefiting off of the emergency health care in the most painful way. Because for me to get treated, it would have to be an emergency. So here's, here's what my typical week looked like in Qatar for like 18 years, okay? Um, I would go to school on like, on like Monday, let's say. You know, go to class, take notes, take my backpack, whatever, school bus, come back home. At some point I realized, whoa, my, um, my elbow hurts a little bit. And I'd already know, oh, okay, I, I'm, I'm bleeding internally. This is going to get painful. This is going to get when my teeth are falling out. I remember my, my pillow just being full of blood. This is going to be painful. And just being in a state of pain, in a state of really impending doom, knowing I could bleed to death like what, what happened when I was four. And there's nothing I can do about it because it's not yet an emergency. So I just sit there. I'd sit there, cry, just in, endure the pain watch my family scramble as they're trying to like what can we do is, is ice gonna help is is vitamin k's apples like um no just, just sit there wait until it's an emergency go to the emergency hospital oh my gosh what happened you should have been more careful it's my fault right um they treat me and i go back home and spend a few days recovering if maybe some week or weeks go to school again that's that's that that's what happened um it wasn't long until we realized okay well i'm not going to be able to go to school every day um so it happened more often that i just stay home and be careful and not do anything i just sit at home my parents went to work lord knows we needed the money uh, my brother was healthy he went to school and this this was the pattern this was the pattern until you know my parents decided hey it's time to do some extracurricular stuff with our children. Now, Tejas is, he can't go, okay, but what about, what about his brother? What about my brother? What about uh, Tarun? And so, sure. And so they were like, okay, computers, computers. This was, I don't know, this was like 90, 90 something, eight, nine. Um, computers are a thing. We, they need to know how to use computers. So sent my brother, the healthy one, the only one, to a computer class um, where he would learn a bunch of things and then, you know, I'm just at home all day doing nothing. So he'd come home and then show me what he learned. Uh, show me what he learned. And, and I was like, okay, this is cool. And he'd show me, literally, he'd show me like his open notepad on Windows. Um, right? You know, angular bracket. This is what I learned today. Angular bracket HTML. And then you have to have a head. And the head comes under the HTML, okay? And then you put some stuff in there. And then you close it with like slash head. And then you'd, and he'd like walk me through HTML. And at the end, he was like, okay, now save this as like your name, tejas.html, okay? Open it in your browser, in an explorer. And I was like, oh my gosh, I've seen this before. That's, that's a website. I had all the time in the world at home, remember? So I had a computer with Prince of Persia, some games, nothing much to do. The games eventually got boring. So I was like, what else is there? I knew about the internet. I knew what web pages kind of were. And I was like, oh my goodness, I just made one. And I was like, bro, you're sitting, you're sitting on something massive here. So then, you know, routine continued, parents went to work, brother went to school. I was like, okay, I want to get into this HTML thing. Started playing with HTML and I'm like, oh, ooh, okay, how do I style? Oh, CSS? Ooh. Um, got into Photoshop because back then Photoshop, you would like design these, these, these layouts and then use the slicing tool, export to a web page, and then you would get like HTML table based layout web pages. Awesome. That you could then use with Dreamweaver and front page. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. So at this point, my parents, I love this part, my parents um, saw some promise. They're like, okay, he's showing, he's somehow sitting there doing this, not physically moving, ergo not dying. I see promise, let's invest in this. So they did the best thing they knew what to do at the time, which was put me in a class at some computer school, at Aptech Computer Institute for object-oriented C++. <laughs> at age... 10. <laughs> and so, and so I'm a 10 year old going to this class with like computer science teachers at schools and adults learning C++ and, and you know, they're like, okay, hey everyone, it's time to code. So they open up this blue screen and they're having me write like hash include 
coneo.h. And I'm like, Con Coneo? Is this an ice cream? Are we making an ice cream shop app web page? What was happening? Hash include stdio and all this. All to like in a command prompt, ask for my name and then say, hi, comma, name. And I was like, okay, well, where's the web pages? I, I just, I, I wasn't here for it. No, I finished this. I got a certificate, a diploma with distinction. The, here, here it is on the screen for you. And I was like, yo, okay, what's up? But I, 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 after the course, like the teacher was, was, of course, he was very impressed. He was like, oh my gosh, a 10 year old who can grasp these concepts. Wow. Um, he asked me, he was like, so did the course like do anything for you to meet your expectations or whatever? Um, and I was like, yeah, no. <laughs> And, and he was like, why? And I was like, honestly, man, I just came here to learn about websites. And I, I've been hearing the word web hosting and I want to get like Tages.com and I want to put it online and then send it to my friends. But like, I didn't get that here and uh, I'm a bit disappointed. And he was like, OK, uh, let, let, let me show you. So we go to the computer lab. He opens up. He's like, do you have an HTML file? I brought a flash drive with it. So I had some some HTML stuff. He's like, OK, he opens up smart FTP. And he's like, can you connect to your, I was like, okay. And like drag and drop. And he was like, here, it's hosted. And I was like, what? Really? <gasps> and then, you know, that was when I, I effectively deployed my first website. And I was like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. Oh my. I have to go home and continue. And so I went home, built websites, slicing tool, tables, whatever, um, on on the many, right? And, and, and hosted them. And it was incredible. And it was, um, it was in magazines. And they're like, who is this 13 year old making a website? Um, stuff like this. And I was like, oh my goodness, that's amazing. And fast forward to 2008. At this point, I, I, I'm, I'm past 10. I'm 15 years old. Um, and, you know, same routine. Brother going to school, parents going to work. I'm at home at this point, just playing around with websites. My mother calls me on the, on the phone and says, just checking in. How's your day? I, I have the newspaper here and I see that there's a website contest by the National University of, of Qatar. I think you should try it out. I said, actually, what else am I going to do? I'm, I'm living on this pendulum of emergency, non-emergency. I'm playing with a computer. Why not? Um, and so, okay. I read the brief. It was like, you need to design websites and develop them with um, some type of like sustainability team, either like environmental conservation or teaching or whatever. I chose environmental conservation. The website was called EnvyCon. I built, listen, I'm, I'm 15 years old. I built this thing with like, I don't know if jQuery was a thing. I think I used Scriptaculous or MooTools. MooTools, interactive, beautiful CSS, HTML. Oh my, you've never seen something like this. Um, they had, I had like grass along the bottom as a border with CSS. It was, it was pretty nuts. Um, but perhaps the best part was how I presented this thing to the to the website contest people. I took the HTML and CSS and JavaScript file system. I didn't deploy this one. Took the static files, put them on a CD, put the CD in a DVD box, and was like, "Here you go." <laughs> what? Um, and you know, they, they're looking at this. Okay, they, they open it up. I of course also hosted it and gave them a link. Uh, but they are very impressed with this presentation and whatever. And I was like, "Okay, I submitted it." Let's hope for the best. Let's say a prayer. Let's get this done. A few months later, they're like, hey, Mr. Kumar, we'd like to invite you to the award ceremony just in case, you know, whatever. Go to the award ceremony. Your boy won. I won the first prize, which for me, I was like, I've never won anything. I've been disabled. I've been dying. I've been sick. I've been injured. I've been weak. I won something. Are you kidding me? Woo. And, and the prize, the prize was 10,000 Qatari Riyals, that's the equivalent of like two, two and a half thousand dollars, something like this. Um, for, for a 15 year old, I mean, you know, that's some, that's some make it rain. Um, but I think the bigger thing was a full scholarship for a bachelor's degree in computer science and engineering at the National University of Qatar. Um, pretty awesome. Would have been awesome if, you know, a few years later when I graduated, they let me take it. They didn't. I don't know why we argued a lot, but at some point it was like, look, listen, you're wasting our time. Get out. So I never ended up getting that degree, but instead I got a lot of recognition. I was in a bunch of newspapers. Here's one. And, and here's the newspaper from another angle while the photo was being taken. I was in a lot of publications and people were like, oh my goodness, who is this? That's amazing. He won. What? It was very, it was a big thing in Qatar in 2008 in the, in the media. Um, and it was around this time as well, where um, I was, I, I got my first internship. I was 15 years old, but Qatar University was like, hey, do you want to just have an internship? We'll pay you, uh, do some website stuff. I was like, yeah. 
So I worked on their internal, one of their like intranet uh, websites called Campus Life. It was like a newsletter, kind of making that awesome on, on the web. And it was, it was pretty nice. Uh, by the way, Qatar University, if you're watching, you kind of owe me uh, my degree. I'd like that. Anyway, um, if you agree that they owe me a, a degree, leave a comment below or at them and me on Twitter. Anyway, um, moving on. At this point, I, I had a career, right? I was still, I was, mind you, I was still living on this pendulum of like, I'm healthy, wait for an emergency, I go to the emergency, I come back. This was very traumatic, very traumatic. But things were happening. And I was like, this is pretty freaking rad. Um, not long after this, I'd, I heard about a TEDx event happening in Qatar. And I was like, TEDx? Why not? I could talk. Um, so I, I went to the committee and I said, hey, I'd propose a talk if you're interested. What do you want to talk about? Well, I want to talk about my coding journey because I have this disease and now I, and now I, I, I make websites and it's pretty cool. And they're like, yeah, we've seen you in the newspaper. Sure, do a 10 minute talk. That talk was my first talk ever, still on YouTube, called Paper Cuts Can Kill. Put a link up there. The audio quality is a bit sketch, but first talk ever. I finished that talk, leaving people in tears and everything. It was very emotional, um, but awesome. Things are happening. Not long after this, I get my first job job, not an internship, at a local creative agency called Grow, grow.qa. Um, I, was, I was part of the digital team. And it was a lot of fun. I, I wrote a lot of code. I built a lot of cool things, web sockets. At this point, I knew my stuff, but I knew my stuff on the standard of like Qatar at the time, which was still not like we were still deploying websites industrially by FTP drag and drop back then, right? No AWS, no Vercel, no nothing. So I, I kind of knew my stuff and this was cool. Now I had something going. I figured out a system. In fact, I figured out if I preemptively go before it's an emergency to the hospital, pretend it's an emergency, then maybe I get preventative care. So I had a system, I abused it. Listen, I do what I gotta do to survive, okay? But it was working. I had a job, I had some semblance of healthcare, it was all right. But you know, when things are all right, at some point they stop being, I've kind of noticed. And so we fast forward to the point where my dad is 58 years old. I am, He's 35 years older than me. So I'm 23, I think, whatever. Um, and I, I'm, I'm, really, I'm like, I find out that the law in Qatar at the time, it may have changed, I don't know, was such that when the head of a household, so a man usually in that patriarchal society, um, turns 60 years old, then they have to take their entire family and go back to their country of origin, which is kind of nuts because this was like, we'd been there 18 years at the time. Um, and so I was like, okay, wait, so 60, he's 58. In two years, we go back to India. I lose my job. I lose my sense of normalcy. I die because uh, in India, you, you pay or you die, really. Um, or you have a miserable life where you bleed just enough to not die, but then you stop bleeding somehow. And then like you, there's bone damage and you're all jacked up and you wish you were dead. It's not pretty. Okay, so I was like, oh, this, this is happening in two years. What do I do? And so I panicked. I'm not going to lie. I panicked, prayed, did whatever you, you do in such a crisis and um, applied, l looked for countries with better health care geographically. Where has good health care? Guess what? The U.S. wasn't on this list, surprisingly, um, at the time. Now, knowing what I know, I'm not really that surprised. Um, but a bunch of countries um, in Europe came up with this universal healthcare thing. I was like, this is cool. So I applied to Booking.com and another small startup in Germany. Uh, I interviewed with Booking.com was pretty good, but they really, really, really wanted skills and A-B testing. Like this was big and I hadn't done that much. So they rejected me. Um, thankfully, I BS'd enough of my way through the interview with the German small startup that they were like, yes, come on board. We'll even bring you here. And I was like, wait, 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 say that second part again. You'll even bring me here. Yeah. So awesome. I got a job. I get to live and fight another day, pack my bags, move over. My parents came with me. They left me in Germany. Here's a picture. Um, and it's great. Honestly, it was really, really fun. Um, it was really fun until it wasn't again. Um, no, I came from Qatar not having maybe the experience they wanted, which to be fair, I was like, listen, I'm here for the healthcare. So if I don't have the experience you want, teach me, I'll learn, but like, I'm not going to, uh, I made a few mistakes 
as like kind of a new person in a new team and I, I was met with quite a bit of bullying kind of like who wrote this Indian code um, kind of why did you come it was a mistake to hire you go back to where you came from you know this kind of this kind of thing so someone once told me my my skin color looks like poop anyway uh, not not the healthiest um, but I, I continued there because like listen I'm here for the health care I don't really care I'll endure whatever if I can live and have a sustainable quality of life um, I, I eventually get the German health care they put me on imagine that they put me on a preventative plan so it's not this pendulum of emergency anymore it's literally like preventative health care so I, I take my medicine Monday Wednesday Friday and I'm just good oh my word this is new life so I can work out I can have whoo okay th uh, amazing amazing and so I continue doing this I, I, I enjoy my life um, at this new company I I continue to crush it, I get experience, whatever, and then two years later, I ask for a raise. Um, to which my manager laughs in my face. Literally, he went like, oh, so I've been here a couple years, I feel like I've grown, um, I'd like a raise. And he goes, <laughs> you? No way. No way you're worth that. Come on. Come on. Maybe next year. At which point, I promptly went to Stack Overflow Careers. Uh, they don't have this anymore. But it was a job board where you could search for jobs. And I found companies looking for front-end engineers, which was my thing at the time, and sorted in descending order of salary. Yeah, boy. Applied to the top of the list, interviewed, got it, changed jobs. What's up? Second job, predictable healthcare. Life is getting better. Um, at this job, continue to do great work, so on. I end up being promoted to front-end engineering manager. What's up? Build a team. What's up? Um, and in September of 2017, I think it's even September 27th of 2017, was a day I will never forget, nor will Yves van Hoorne from Code Sandbox. I'll tell you about that in a second. But this was Zeit Day Berlin. You may know Zeit today as Vercel. It was called Zeit back then. Um, where I was able to go and hang out with Guillermo Rauch, um, his, his wife, Elisa. Uh, Evis, uh, when Code Sandbox wasn't even a thing, but it was like his first, he was like 17, he was like, hey, I made this thing called Code Sandbox. I was like, oh, cool. Um, and of course, you know, Dan Abramov. I, I got to meet all these people. I was like, ooh, nice. Um, I also got to learn from them. Great talks from Dan, from Evis, from Guillermo. Um, really nice. And I was like, this is a vibe. This is a vibe. That was five years ago. This is a vibe. Um, stood there, hung out, talked to a bunch of people, left eventually. Um, and I left in a way that I, I was never the same. I was like, that's amazing. So I started looking for meetups and stuff. I found a Google, a GDG, Google Developer Group meetup here in Berlin. Um, and I was like, you know, I'll just apply to speak. Applied to speak, got accepted, did a talk, and it was amazing. It was everything I wanted and more. So much so, the people stuck around after my time slot and we just like hacked. And it was so much fun. And I, I give a shout out to the organizer, Niborsa, for it. Thank you. It was really fun. Um, from there, you know, I, I met a nice girl, uh, who was good at giving me my medicine and stuff once in a while. Um, and you know, around the first few months with her, I, I said, I, I love this thing and so on. I found out JSConfEU was looking for speakers. JSConfEU had a, a call for proposals open and I was like, oh, I spoke at a meetup. I could try. Why not? Because keep in mind, at this time, my life is predictable. It's, it's awesome. I have, preventative, I have preventative health care. I have a job. I have a partner. Honestly, what more could I ask for? Especially coming from where I came from. Applied to JSConf EU. They have an amazing anonymous uh, call for papers proposal process where they don't look at like who you are, what you do, what skin color. They're just like, what is the talk about? What is the title? What is it abstractly about? Um, I submitted mine. Um, they accepted it a year later. I was like, oh my gosh, I am speaking at JSConf EU, the biggest JavaScript conference in Europe. What? No way. And so we celebrated a little bit. I was like, oh my goodness. Fast forward a little bit. I, I did my talk and, and the side stage, it was pretty well received. And, you know, in many ways, the rest is history because from there I met great people. I was invited to speak at more events after based on that one talk and it, it got phenomenally well. I owe so much of my career and a massive word of gratitude and thanks 
to Jan Lenhardt, to Malte Ubel, to Krisa, to Feli. Oh my gosh, like these people made my life what it is today. And I wouldn't be like, and there's, there's plenty more names from there, but I, I wouldn't be as blessed if it wasn't for them. So huge, huge thanks um, to that. And so, you know, from there, speaking engagements happened. Uh, I continued growing in my programming skills, continued enjoying the medicine, started working out because I can. Um, and life generally got better. We had a pandemic in between. Um, and, and now we're, you know, five, three to five years later. Um, three to five, because I don't know if you want to count the pandemic years or not, but that's here we are. So the question now, where am I today? Um, well, for starters, I'm very traumatized. Now that you know what I've been through, 18 years on a pendulum from I'm healthy to this is an emergency, I'm dying, I see you, whatever, back to normal. 18 years of that. I've got post-traumatic stress. I've got um, some semblance of bipolar or borderline personality disorder. I'm, I'm not a healthy person mentally or even physically. There's lasting damage on my bones from all of the bleeding. I can't extend my arms. So like, this is the maximum I can extend this arm. I can extend this one like 90 degrees. So I have a lot of damage mentally, physically, emotionally, probably. Um, I still don't have a degree. Qatar University. What's up? At this point, I, I should get like an honorary one anyway. Um, and I'm, unemployed. I, I don't have a job. Um, I don't honestly, given how jacked up I am, I don't know if a team would want me or have it. Like, I don't know if I'd be a good fit even because of all my, you know, um, I'd like to be, but, but I don't know. What I can tell you is I am doing the best I can with what I have. And I'm thankful for that. I, I really am. I can say that confidently. Um, in 2020, I got new medicine. So before I had to like, inject my medicine into my my veins i had to do it myself they trained me um three times a week monday wednesday friday in 2020 there was a new experimental research drug that lasted longer that i didn't need to top up three times a week i could take it once a week so i switched to this and it's incredible and i'm still on the medicine i still have the disease things haven't really improved other than healthcare and community which i am monumentally grateful for in fact here like stay right there look this is this is my suitcase that I that I came here to Australia with. Look at all of this here. Look at this. Let me give you. This is all medicine which I have to take. Um, and if I don't take it, guess what? I I die. Still, I bleed to death. Um, and I'm thankful for it. That and you and all of these blessings to me makes makes life brilliant. Um, and I feel in many ways like I'm just getting started. I would like to finish this whole thing. If you've stayed this long, by the way, appreciate you. Subscribe to the channel. There's, if you want more, or leave me a comment, let me know. Um, I want to leave you with an encouragement because in Steve Jobs' like Stanford commencement address, he said something that I, I really like. Um, I'll just, maybe I'll put the video, maybe I won't, I'll put a link up there. He says, um, you know, looking forward when you're young, you, you, you see a bunch of dots but you don't see how they connect. Stuff happens, you don't see how they connect. With time, looking back, the dots connect. And I feel like that is that is my lived experience. Like when I was a child in, in the emergency hospital, near death, often, I didn't know that being forced into coding because there was nothing else I could do would lead me to, to make websites to win awards, to give talks, to move to Germany. I didn't know these dots would connect, but now I, I see that. And I see that there's been this beautiful alignment of events in my life that leads me to where I am today. And I can't help but just be thankful and believe that I am blessed beyond measure. I really am. Um, and in many ways, like when I was a child, when I was in the middle of it, when I was in, in the pain of emergency healthcare, and, and whatever, and not knowing if it would last. Um, I wanted to die. I wished that my mother would have had that abortion. I, in the middle of it, I saw this disease as this curse, this biggest horrible thing. Why was I born this way? But, but all these years later, when, when the dots connect, what I, what, I, what I really see is that the thing that I thought and condemned as a curse for most of my life 
might have actually been a blessing. I really believe it. Because, hey, if I didn't have the sickness, I wouldn't have learned to code. I wouldn't have done talks. I wouldn't have had the life I have today. Who knows where I would have been? I believe that I am living on the best timeline. I believe that we are living on the best timeline. I believe that everything that happens, happens for the good. Um, and so if, if you're in some scenario today where you're seeing a bunch of dots, it's hard, you're going through stuff. Life is complex, believe me, I know. And if you're seeing this stuff, I wanna tell you, listen, the dots connect. The dots connect. And I'm, I'm here. I'm, I'm here to listen. I'm here to support you and others any way I can. Because believe me, I know what support means to people. Okay. Um, the dots connect. Uh, with that, I want to I wanna wrap it up here. If, if you feel encouraged, if you feel inspired, if you feel there's anything at all of value in this, uh, won't you share it on your social media with your friends or leave me a comment below. Maybe at me on Twitter. Um, thanks for sticking around. Thanks for letting me share this. I appreciate you. Um, until the next one, peace. So it's time to take my medicine. I just so happened to be recording on the same day. And I figured since we've got to know each other quite well, uh, if you want to be a part of it, um, I can just take my shot on camera. Uh, this isn't for the faint of hearts. So if you're put off by blood or something, maybe don't watch this. But for those who are interested in how IVs work, and if you're curious, stick around. Let's have some fun. Um, the plan is to put it in, in, in one of my veins, probably this one, or maybe this one. Um, we will see. Uh, but for now, let me just make sure the tech is working. Yeah, looks good. All right, let's go ahead and, and do this. What I'm going to do is I'm going to get um, my medicine out of this box here. There's a camera thing here. Ignore it. I, 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 it's a makeshift stand, maybe. Anyway, so this is the medicine. I take 3,500 units of recombinant clotting factor 8. Um, that's, that's the 500. This is the 3,000. And what we're going to do is open it up and uh, prepare the medicine. So it comes in, it comes in a powder. Um, this, is, this is what it looks like, if it'll focus. It comes in a powder like this. And you reconstitute it with water. Then you just shoot it up. Let's get this. So, I am not, it comes with a syringe too, of, of pure water. I'm actually not going to use that because I have two things. And to change a syringe is hard. Like when there's a needle sticking in your vein, you know. Um, so two boxes, I'm just going to quickly, this is the probably the strangest YouTube unboxing you've seen. Um, anyway, education is important. By the way, if I don't take this, I will have serious problems as we've covered. So kind of important. I'm glad. Thank you for being a part of it. For realsies. So this thing is a little plastic um, like needle thing that, that basically punctures this so I can get water into it. Um, so we will just like that. We'll do the same for this red person. I, I really, I'm glad you're, you're part of this. Um, so here, let's do this. Nice. Okay. Um, now we use the supplied syringe to get some liquid inside. The syringes, um, come filled with, with some type of liquid. So my autofocus doesn't seem to work, whatever. Um, so just like, like that. And we push, get the liquid in. There's a second syringe somewhere here. And we will do the same thing. So just screw the thing on, pop off that lid, and we shall, all right, just like that. Look at that, okay. I'm just gonna let that sit for a while and clean up. I don't really 
need these boxes. Actually, I do need the boxes because I give the hospital back uh, my used vials just for record keeping so that they know what I'm taking and I'm not smuggling it or something, probably. Now it's time for my big bag of goodies. I have a lot of things, including a device here to... Sorry, I wasn't looking. I don't know which camera to look at. Um, this thing is... a. It's a tagebook. It's a journal to keep track of my infusions. I'm going to turn that on and let it uh, come up to speed. And then we have a bigger syringe. Since um, this is two vials, it's just larger. A bunch of other goodies in here. I think I'm actually going to... I need some stuff. I need... I need a tourniquet. This one is awesome. It has... I don't know if you can see, but it has... Um, has dinosaurs on it. Love it. They give these to children. And alcohol swabs. One for before, one for after. Okay, this is the setup. So what we're going to do um, is... Look, this thing has actually come back up the plunger a little bit. So we will put back all the water, push back some air, and we'll get this into our bigger syringe. And I mean, it's, I feel like this isn't rocket science. So this is the clotting agent. This liquid I'm extracting here is a blood clotting agent that is lethal. If you take this, you will die because you will have a heart attack or stroke. Actually, you'll have a stroke. Um, cardiac arrest is what will happen to you. Um, whereas for me, I will continue to live. Isn't that wild anyway? Let's get all of this goodness in here. Is that it? So every drop counts. This is this is extremely valuable. I mean, for me, this is the equivalent of like life force. So I'm just gonna check. There's still some in here. So I'm gonna push some air out and we'll grab, grab some more. Grab some more life force. Wow. I feel it already. I'm so hyped for this. Okay. Is this empty? Yeah, almost. Great. All right. So I will move the vials out of the way. Um, keep just the essentials nearby. And then lastly, the piece to inject is, is this. So this is a, this is a butterfly needle, um, a tiny one. It's a scalp vein set. They, they use this on infants in the head veins when, when newborn babies are born. Um, it's small enough that it doesn't damage my veins, even if I use it a lot, which is great. So, let's get rid of some of the air here. Okay, that should be good. Um, and now, I'm just going to very carefully push this, just prime the needle, so just push a little bit. Look at that. Life force. All right, so we're almost good. Just want to get a consistent stream into my little tube in here. Okay, so far so good. Now I need to be very careful because I, if I'm not careful, I will lose tons and tons of valuable medicine. And if I'm also not careful enough, I will inject a bunch of air into my veins and then kill myself. You think I'm joking? My life literally hangs by a thread, y'all. All right, I think we're good. So clean up. It's important to keep a clean workstation. How are we doing here? Okay, this is pretty good. Okay, alcohol swabs, syringes we can put away for now. Clean, clean, clean. Perfect, all right, it's almost showtime. Um, get the tourniquet on and like this will help get blood going um, huge vein my usual go-to so we, we clean this with alcohol but we'll open another one for later okay just like that okay 
how are we doing on the cameras? Y'all have a good view. I like it. Okay. Um, clean. It's really important to disinfect everything. All right. So I can't extend my elbow, so I'm going to do this bent elbow style. All right. And here we go. It is time for the stabbing. Hmm. Okay, this should be good. Ready? One, two, three. And that's it. We're in. I didn't feel a thing. You can see there's blood in the tubing. Pretty good. Okay. We are home free now. We very carefully push the medicine through. Very carefully. Very important to stay perfectly still because this needle can move, and if the needle moves and comes out, I'm pretty much screwed. All right, so we got, I don't know if you can see that, but we got like six ml to go. Very slowly, occasionally checking if blood's coming still. Very, very slowly. Beautiful. It doesn't hurt going in, it shouldn't, but I just do this over two minutes, gently, feeling absolutely no pressure at all to perform for the cameras, because this is literally my life here. pretty rad that I get this because if I don't I'm in Australia right now doing this because Germany gives me this I'm so thankful y'all all right we're done we are done with this so we push one last push as hard as we can get the last drops all right so now we use our new alcohol swab We're going to bleed a lot and we gently pull out the needle okay and stop the bleeding so now that's it i hold it like this for a few minutes until the bleeding stops which it will because i'm now full of blood clotting factor i'm full of three and a half thousand units of it which will last me a week until next monday uh i'm i'm good and after or at least after the blood stops, I'm going to go on this thing um, and enter that I did this at 7.30 p.m. Australia time, which is 9.30 a.m. Monday German time. Um, I, I really appreciate you being a part of this. Thank you so much. Just an insight into my life. Um, appreciate you. If you stayed this long, I think you might as well subscribe now because <laughs> like, we're, we're friends. But if even if you don't, that's cool. Um, I'll catch you in the next one. Peace.